Now, BBC One Scotland pays tribute to an amazing Scotswoman who, sacrificing her own safety to help Jewish children persecuted by the Nazis, was killed in one of the regime's most notorious death camps. Jane Henning was a light that shone in the darkness in the midst of the hatred and horrors of the Second World War and of the Holocaust, which created an atmosphere of terror in the world. She extended love to everybody and everyone that she contacted with. I had very few choices. She had every choice to leave Hungary to protect herself, and she didn't. I don't think she realized the brutality of the Germans that they would ever dare, as a Scottish citizen, take her to Auschwitz and tattoo her and, and kill her. This is the story of a quiet farmer's daughter from Dumfriesshire who ended her life a slave labourer in the most notorious extermination camp the world has ever known, becoming the only Scot to be officially honoured for giving her life for Jews in the Holocaust. It begins a long way in every sense from the barbed wire fences of Auschwitz in the village of Dunskor, among the rolling hills of rural Dumfriesshire. Jane Haining was born on the 6th of June, 1897. She grew up on this farm, the third daughter of local clergyman Thomas Haining and his wife, Jane Matheson. Dunskor is proud of the woman who devoted her later life to looking after Jewish children hundreds of miles away. Hers is a story they want the rest of the country to know. Few people in Scotland outside Dunsker here have ever heard of Jane Haining. I'm setting off to find out who she was and what made her the internationally renowned figure she's become 70 years later. When Jane was just five years old, her mother died. She spent the rest of her childhood mothering her sisters and helping to run the household. That nurturing instinct continued when, at the age of 12, Jane went to board at Dumfries Academy. She was said to be shy and timid, but with a tendency to look after other girls a propensity that would one day lead her to a matron's job in a school far away. Jane was also an outstanding student, winning 41 prizes. She excelled at languages, but it would be many years before she put that particular talent into practice. Instead, she pursued business in Glasgow, gaining a high-powered secretarial job at the huge J.P. Coates weaving factory in Paisley. For the next 10 years, Jane went to church here in Glasgow at what was then called Queen's Park West. These windows were later installed in memory of a woman who was driven by a strong Christian faith to do more and to give more with her life. I just think that was the whole sum and substance of the woman, her faith. She was a clever cookie. She was actually the secretary in the Sunday school. She was very interested in the mission to Jews. And although she was happy here and felt very fulfilled, she didn't feel this was her life's commitment. She felt the, there was more. Jane's chance came at the start of 1932, when an advertisement for the job of matron at the Scottish Mission to the Jews in Budapest caught her eye. She applied at once and was accepted. As matron of a school run by the Church of Scotland, she'd be going out to Hungary as a missionary. Jane came here to Edinburgh to train, and you can imagine the, the sense of excitement and quiet purpose as she was dedicated to missionary service at St Stephen's Church on the 19th of June, 1932. Next morning, she set out for Budapest. <laughs> Thank you. 
Budapest, the capital of Hungary, on the banks of the Danube. As ostentatiously grand, colorful and vibrant today as it was in the early 1930s. Jane would have discovered a flourishing cultural life orchestrated by a prosperous middle class, many of whom were Jews. Over 60% of the doctors are Jewish, over half of the lawyers are Jewish as well, around a third of the journalists are Jewish. And this is one of the reasons why it was known as Judapest, because of the very high proportion of Jews who lived there. This is the Vorosmarty Utsa State School. It was here that Jane arrived in 1932 to be house mother in a school then known as the Scottish Mission to the Jews. The life and worship of the school were overtly Christian, but Jewish parents clamoured to get their girls educated here. I think it had to do with the quality of education that the girls received and also with the way in which the girls were accepted. Jewish girls who came here were not seen as second-class pupils. They were just as welcome, and nor did they need to check their Jewish identity at the door because while there was religious education, the girls who were of a Jewish background also received Jewish religious education. As minister of the adjoining St. Columba's Church of Scotland, Aaron Stevens regularly walks the same corridors as Jane would have as she went about her daily life in the school. What sort of role did she have then here in the school? She was part of a larger staff. Her main role was really to take care of the children who were living here. If children were doing homework, maybe even on this balcony in good sunlight, she would be the one listening to a girl reading while some others were in the corner playing. And if someone was upset with the result of the game, she would then become a referee of sorts. Uh, in, at the end of the day, she's the one that made sure they were in bed. They brushed their teeth, that if someone uh, they had a nightmare, they could cry out to her. She was the mother for those who weren't living at home anymore. Being their mother, that I'm discovering, is what brought Jane into these children's hearts and what keeps her there 70 years later. I remember her being very kind and very welcoming and very warm. I woke up the first morning and my bed was soiled because I must have lost control of my powers. And uh, I was very embarrassed. But Miss Haney came in <coughs> and she sent all the children out of the room. And she cleaned me up, which was very nice. She never scolded me. I was so scared. But she never scolded me. She made me feel good. She said, it's all right. I was a little bit a a for her pupils, Jane Haining embodied, and has now come to symbolize, the values of fairness, tolerance and equality that drove the whole Scottish mission. De a soha nem éreztük, hogy mi nem lettünk volna egyformák, bármely egymás között is, és, na, és a, a keresztény tanulók között is. Nem is vettük észre, nem is nagyon tudtuk, hogy ki az, aki kereszt, keresztény tanuló, és ki az, aki zsidó. A skultiskola egy csodálatos iskola volt a... But this was more than just a school. It was becoming a haven for the Jews of Hungary and beyond in a Europe that increasingly throughout the 1930s was turning against them. Why? Less than a year after Jane Haining arrived in Budapest, Adolf Hitler was elected Chancellor of Germany. The Hungarian political elite tended to gravitate towards Nazi Germany in the 1930s. The Hungarian Jewish population see themselves as different from the rest of the Jewish populations of Eastern Central Europe. They see themselves as successfully assimilated within Hungarian culture. But in social terms, they're not really accepted because there's still a latent casual anti-Semitism which sort of pervades Hungarian society. 
In 1939, the Nazis invaded Poland and Britain declared war on Germany. Hungary's nationalist government began to concede anti-Semitic laws to undermine its more demanding fascist sympathizers before then allying itself with Germany. The earliest victims were non-Hungarians on the margins of society. The authorities started to detain Jews who had lived in Budapest for decades without citizenship. Gabriela Hanjal, a former pupil of the Scottish Mission, remembers the day in 1941 when police came for her neighbors. They collected them with a four years old grandson and I was weeping very much because I knew that what terrible thing happens with them. And the son, he told me, don't weep because we go only excursion by train. So, and we never, I will never forget it. Excursions by train were becoming terrifyingly common for Jews across Europe as more and more territories fell to the Nazis. Hungary's alliance with Germany kept invasion at bay and the government continued to protect the lives of its Hungarian Jews. But they did lose jobs, social position, civil rights and respect. Former pupil Eva Haller, now a prominent social activist in America, has never forgotten how this school restored that respect. Today, she's returned for the first time in 70 years. The gratitude of having been treated a certain way that allowed me my dignity is enormous. The sense of respect that I can do what I needed to do at the age of 14, again, gives this place a very special meaning. At a tea party in what used to be the Scottish Mission, other former pupils are eager to get across to me what Jane was like. She was strict, she was just, she had deep feelings. She was easy to love. She uh, put a lot of effort into planning the Christmas celebrations and and it was always good to be with her. We see the humanity in her. And we see her, her standing up for what's right, her character. She, she wrote to all of the parents saying she was going to stay here with the children, and she kept her word. She said, even this many years on, it's difficult to, to speak about her, the fact that she stayed here, she kept her word, so that the children who were here would still feel safe in the worst of times. Staying here when she could have left. This is the crux of Jane Haining's story. The Church of Scotland, increasingly alarmed for the safety of its missionaries in Europe, sent repeated letters urging her to come home. She refused. She wrote, if these children needed me in days of sunshine, how much more do they need me in these days of darkness? To sustain herself in the gathering darkness, Jane often looked up to the Buddha hills and quoted the Psalm, I will lift mine eyes to the mountains from whence comes my help. But in the growing Nazi menace, she was dealing with forces that nothing could possibly have prepared her for. She could not grasp the evil in which she was functioning. It was just not part of her ability to understand what she was confronted with. She lived in a different world, a world you know, that was civilized and reasonable and rational, and where people didn't kill each other for no reason. She didn't go back when she had a chance. She could have gone back to Scotland and stay there in safety, but she couldn't live with herself if she went back, and she would feel that she abandoned her children. She thought she can help. And then the outlook suddenly darkened even further. Suspicious of his allies' trustworthiness, Hitler at last turned his attention on Hungary and its Jews. 
It was 1944, March 19, on a Sunday, when the Nazi troops marched into Budapest. My father owned the biggest jewelry store in Hungary, and next Monday, there was a cordon around our, our store. Nobody could enter it. They closed it down. Next morning, of course, we got a phone call that we shouldn't come near our home because the Nazis were there. And when they didn't find us, they were went berserk and started throwing our furniture down from the sixth floor to the ground and, and <laughs> tormented everybody around why they let us go. One day we were living in our home and next day we were told we have to move to a, a designated area. Then one day we could still listen to the voice of America, Radio Free Europe, and next day we had to give in our radios. And the next day we had to give in all the jewelry and the next day all of our cameras. And you know, it was, it was sort of gradually, things happened. Akkor nagyon kedvesen vigasztalt minket, körülálltuk őt, és elmondtuk a félelmeiket, és azt mondta, ne féljünk, higgyük el, őnek is sokkal több félni valója van. Ő érezte, hogy neki félni, valamiért ő is félt. She was right to fear. Jane wept as she sewed on the yellow stars that branded her children. But her open sympathy put Jane herself in grave danger. It only took one incident to light the touch paper. Within weeks of the invasion, Jane scolded the cook's son-in-law for eating food intended for the girls. He informed on her. The next morning, a Gestapo police car arrived at the school. The Nazis had come for Jane Haining. A German SS document records that on the 25th or 26th of April, Jane Haining was arrested on suspicion of espionage on behalf of England. Jane herself described to a fellow prisoner the list of charges. She was accused of working among the Jews. Weeping when she saw the girls attending class wearing yellow stars. Dismissing her housekeeper, who was an Aryan listening to the news broadcasts of the BBC, receiving many British visitors, sending parcels to British prisoners of war, and being active in politics. Jane freely acknowledged that she had indeed done all of these things, except meddle in politics. That charge, she told her interrogators heatedly, was completely false. Jane's friends searched for her and eventually found her here in Foutsa prison. They visited regularly with fresh underwear and food parcels until one day they turned up and Jane was gone. The guards would not tell them where. In fact, Jane was on her way to Poland, to an area that the Nazis had turned into both a chillingly efficient killing factory and a brutal camp for forced labor. We know it as Auschwitz. As Jane was thrust into a train in May 1944, the industrial slaughter of Jews was reaching its zenith. For the next six weeks, 12,000 Hungarian Jews every day were packed off to Auschwitz. Among them, a famously neat and orderly middle-aged Scotswoman squeezed into a cattle truck for the long journey, without, we must assume, food or drink or sanitation, with the wails of children and the groans of the dying and the smell of death itself for company. Here on this platform is where hundreds of thousands of Hungarian deportees, blinking in the sunshine, staggered out of the cattle trucks. Most of the Jews went straight to the gas chambers just up there. The stronger looking ones were selected for work. At least Jane Haining, as a political prisoner, didn't have to undergo that selection. When Jane Haining and her fellow prisoners uh, reached this place, they could be taken for the female camp. 
they were to introduce all the personal information, date of birth, place of birth, profession, and then they were taken for disinfection. They were shaved. The numbers were tattooed on the left forearm. What do you think about when you imagine a gentle Scottish woman in her late 40s who has certainly grown up on a farm but hasn't done any hard labour for a very long time, if ever, finding herself in this situation? Very difficult. Not only the horrible work, heavy work, but first of all the terrible treatment by the Germans. All the time screaming, all the time yelling, with the dogs chasing the prisoners from one place to the other, with the sticks hitting constantly. So just the scale of humiliation was just the first lesson they were being given that the chances to survive here are really few. One who did survive was Sabo Miklosne. She was among a number of Jane's Jewish pupils, who, although they didn't go there with Jane herself, also ended up in Auschwitz. Tényleg a testvéremet, anyámat, mindenkit elveszítette, nagyszüleimet, az egész családot, a barátaimat. Még kint is nagyon sok skótossal találkoztam, együtt voltunk, akik az intézetben is ott voltak lányok. És talán, talán egy vagy kettő jött hozzá közülük, azok mind ott maradtak. Ahogy így hallottam, hogy mi szénénk is ettől beteg lett ettől a ennivalótól, ami ott volt. Gondolom, hogy az nagyon árthatott neki. Egy ilyen pedás tiszta nő, és az a moslék, amit adtak ott, az tényleg egy felnőtt azt nem bírja el. Képzelhetetlen, hogy megbírja enni. I can't imagine, I think Auschwitz defeats the imagination. What it would have been like here for Jane Haining. With the staggering influx of Hungarians into the Birkenau camp, She'd arrived in the middle of the largest mass murder in modern history. In all, more than a million human beings were killed here at Auschwitz. The old, the young, the unborn. People from every social background, in every state of health. There's no picture of Jane here, because by 1944, the murders were so frequent that photographing prisoners was deemed a waste of money. 700 inmates crammed into a barrack, freezing in winter, sweltering in summer. Sharing her bed with three other women, the neat and tidy Jane Haining, shaven-headed, diseased, and crawling with lice. I think I find this the most moving moment of all, actually, because this is the barrack where Jane Haining was living right at the end of her life. Barrack nine, this is it. In censored German and a shaky hand, Jane wrote to a friend at the Scottish Mission with heartbreaking banality, asking about the school's supplies of flour and eggs, obsessing perhaps about food. She asks about her friend's old aunt, but of this place of horror, what does she say? She says, there's not much to report from here. But there is one detail, one detail from the woman who had so loved the hills of Dunscore and the hills of Budapest and who knew, of course she knew, that she wasn't going to see them ever again. She writes, even here, on the way to heaven, are mountains. Two days later, Jane Haining was dead. She'd survived for just two months. A postcard was sent to the Church of Scotland in Edinburgh. It read, Miss Haining, who was arrested on account of justified suspicion of espionage against Germany, died in hospital on the 17th of July from Kakezia, following intestinal catarrh. Whether Jane Haining 
was one of the many workers who were gassed because they became too sick to work, or whether, as seems more likely, she died of starvation and ill treatment and disease in hospital, as the authorities claimed, her body would have come here burned in one of the 15 furnaces in the crematorium, which had been usefully built right next to the gas chamber. The Germans destroyed all this before they hastily left in 1945. Jane's ashes are here, somewhere here in Birkenau, along with all the others. Jane Haining died at the age of 47. 1,300 miles from the hills of her birth. And the quiet heroism of the only Scottish woman known to have died at Auschwitz took a long time to be recognised. But in 1997, after an initiative from Queen's Park Church in Glasgow and a 10-year investigation by an Israeli board, Jane was named Righteous Among Nations at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. In 2010, she was awarded a Hero of the Holocaust medal by the British government. It's difficult to imagine a more anonymous death or a less showy kind of heroism than Jane Haining's. But it's clear that the woman whose character and, and whose faith were forged among these stones, these hills, made a sacrifice for those Jewish children that today is recognised far and wide. I think of that little lady who refused to leave Hungary and refused to leave her Jewish children. The debt is enormous. The debt goes beyond Jane. It goes to the country that gave birth to Jane and to the culture that gave birth to Jane. I think the world would be a happier place if some feelings and some of her personality, some of her characteristics, her attitude to life, to Semitism, to children, were more evident in people. I, I just admire this woman tremendously. She has implanted in me that we don't live just for ourselves, but that we live for each other, and that the purpose of our life is to help each other. Jane exemplifies for us a way that people can be honest to their own faith, and not only not threatening to people of others, but protecting people of other traditions. If people say, why do we need that story today? I would say, how can we not? But for me, the most poignant memorial is a simple stone found among the hills of Dunscore, among her family, the place and the people that loaned Jane Haining to the world.